students and the administrators of the campus to hear one of the distinguished scholars in the Pacific address us today, Dr. Sioni Latu Kefu. It is an honor for all of us to have him here with his wife, Dr. Ruth Fink Latu Kefu. Many people who know Dr. Sioni Latu Kefu have described him in superlative ways. As a preeminent scholar in Pacific history, as a wise and loyal colleague, as a compassionate yet no-nonsense administrator, and as a devout Christian and minister in the Methodist Church. You can read the short summary of his professional life in the program. But in addition to that, you need to know he is a gentleman in the classic sense, dignified in his bearing with the demeanor that Tongans call Fotunga Fara'e'eki, or regal countenance. He carries that dignified presence wherever he goes, whether in a church service, a scholarly seminar, or a presentation such as this. It is my privilege to introduce to you now Dr. Sione Latu Kefu to speak on cultural dynam dynamism in the Pacific. Which way are we going? Dr. Latu Kefu. Mr. President, <clears throat> Vice President, heads of various faculties and staff and students, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your very kind word of introduction. I would also on behalf of my wife and myself, say how much we have enjoyed the few days we have been here with you and appreciate the care that you have taken of us. In particular, I would like to thank those who are responsible for including my wife in your invitation. This is a most humane gesture and a very unusual one. And I deeply appreciate that. Cultural dynamism in the Pacific which way are we going? Culture is a much used and abused term with a very large number of definitions. It is no longer a technical term used simply by anthropologists and other social scientists. We find it common for Pacific Islanders to talk about their cultures in what might be appropriately called the, pre the present era of cultural relations in the Pacific. For this lecture, I propose to use the term culture to refer to the total way of life of a society. A society being a group of people who are dependent on one another for survival and well-being. Culture includes the society's material possessions, technology and economy, social organization, its regular daily and ceremonial behaviors, value and belief systems, language and expressive arts, thought patterns, 
and its formal, legal, and political institutions. It is a complex whole, the sum total of a rather complicated interaction of its various components with its geographical environment. In the process of this interaction, change is stimulated so that culture is continually growing or being transformed. At certain times, such growth and change may be so slow as to be almost undetectable, while at other times it may be extremely rapid. But cultures everywhere have a dynamic capacity for growth. The historical period, which has been termed the post-colonial era, is a period of such rapid cultural dynamism, and we are experiencing this at present all over the Pacific region, including here in Hawaii. Traditional Pacific Island cultures the term traditional Pacific Island cultures has been used to refer to cultures which originated among Pacific Islands societies prior to or at the time of first organized foreign settlements in the 18th and 19th centuries. They are divided into three cultural divisions. Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. Polynesia, from Greek, many islands, from Polus and Nasus, and Melanesia, small islands, uh, Melanesia, I'm sorry, black islands, Melas black, and Micronesia, small islands. Spreading over a vast area which consists about a third of the world's surface and separated from one another by vast expanse of ocean. These cultures were numerous, small and diverse. In spite of their diversity culturally, the geographical environments were similar with the exception of the inland areas of larger islands, especially Papua New Guinea. Coastal peoples had to adapt to the typical tropical vegetation and their material possessions and means of exploiting their resources were very similar to each other. In their subsistence economies, none of their crops Storable for periods longer than a year. Unlike the rice growing tropical areas of Asia or the grain growers of more temperate climate, therefore crops could not be accumulated as form of wealth and any surplus had to be shared, commonly at times of feasting and ceremonial. In doing so, in addition to other considerations, those who were able to be lavish in distributing food, pigs, and other valuables gained influence and power over others. Among traditional cultures of Polynesia, which were more homogeneous in their languages and cultures, the societies tended to be socially stratified economically and politically chiefly with ascribed leadership determined in most cases by virtue of birth. The successor of a chiefly title inherited an office and with it power over a relatively large social political unit. By contrast, societies in Melanesia were more culturally diverse with many different languages and customs 
while at the same time they tended to be socially, economically, and politically more egalitarian with an achieved leadership. Their leaders, known as big men, gained their positions mainly, not the only consideration, but mainly through lavish distributions of wealth produced by their wives over small, fragmented socio-political units. When a socio-political unit became too big for the influence of a big man, a rival big man and his followers would break away and establish a new, completely autonomous socio-political unit. Micronesia was in between these two extremes. The Pacific Way, a modern concept. While one can perceive many broad similarities between the cultures of the Pacific, it would be a misleading, it would be misleading to assume that there was any self-conscious acknowledgement of such similarities until very recently. Politicians and academics in recent years have begun to use the expression Pacific Way. But this is quite a new idea. Coinage of the term being attributed to Ratu Sekamasesimara of Fiji. The Pacific Way is for the present and future generation of the Pacific Islanders to develop. In the meantime, all these traditional Pacific cultures have undergone many changes as a result of the external influences which have affected the Pacific region as they have done in other parts of the world. The present, the social, economic, political and religious realities of the Pacific today are the resultant synthesis of culture context between indigenous peoples of the Pacific and encroaching foreigners, Europeans in particular, during the past two and a half centuries. These contexts often proved disastrous in many respects, prompting one keen observer to refer to them collectively as a fatal impact. At the same time, however, they ushered in certain positive advantages, some of which the Pacific Islanders accepted promptly, such as metal tools and other material goods, and other aspects of European civilizations which were adopted more gradually and often reluctantly, such as valuing education, Christian ethics, and morality. Once accepted, however, they are then in eventually made into integral parts of the modern cultures of Oceania. Social dynamic, rapid depopulation to population explosion. One of the negative aspects of the increasing contact with foreigners during the second half of the 18th and century, and then 18th century and the 19th century, was the alarmingly fast rate of depopulation among the islanders, caused by a combination of European introduced diseases to which Pacific Islanders had no immunity, such as measles, typhoid, tuberculosis, and venereal diseases firearms which intensified the frequency of destructiveness of local warfare, particularly in Polynesia. The Melanesians used the guns more for, gun, for hunting than fighting. Alcohol and tobacco which endangered general health. The infamous labor traffic and lack of proper sanitation and personal hygiene. Some islands experience population declines of up to
to 70 and 80 percent. Guam dropped by 98 percent, mainly because of 25 years war between Spanish soldiers and the local people who had killed Roman Catholic missionaries in the 17th century. Many contemporary observers came to the conclusion that the entire population of the Pacific would eventually disappear from the surface of the earth in the not too distant future, referring to the rapid decline, declining Maori population of New Zealand in the last century, a Pakeha a Pakeha politician remarked that the kindest thing that the Pakeha could do for the Maoris was to smooth the dying pillow for them. The Pacific Islanders, however, have survived this near fatal encounter. The vitality, the vitality, dynamics, and resilience of their cultures enable them to respond positively to the spiritual well and welfare activities of various Christian missions, particularly in their endeavors to establish and maintain peace among enemy groups, as well as to provide educational and health services up to World War II, and the efforts of colonial governments in pacification, introduction of the rule of law, banning those traditional activities which were regarded as barbaric or incompatible with humanity and harmful to society such as cannibalism, human sacrifice, widow strangling, infanticide, warfare, murder, theft, and other practices which were regarded as unlawful in the colonial codes of laws which were imposed on the societies concerned. The strict control of the sale and consumption of liquor, and in the more recent post-World War period, serious promotion of education and health services occurred. Depopulation was arrested and ostentatiously reversed. Consequently, the absence of tribal warfare and improved health services, better tired, sanitation and hygiene, contributed to the acceleration of population growth. Now, ironically, a population explosion has become a real concern in most of the Pacific Islands with the exception of Melanesia, where land shortage is not yet a serious problem. Attempts have now been made, however, to control this new problem, including official family planning programs and both internal and ex external migration. Britain moved groups of Gilbert Islanders to the Solomon Islands and Fiji after the war to relieve pressure from overpopulation and thousands of Pacific Islanders, particularly from Polynesia and Micronesia, have been migrating mainly to New Zealand, Australia and the United States. A few years ago, a nasty uh, journalist reported uh, three Tongans who stowed away uh, to America were caught and re returned, asked the question, what's wrong now with paradise? Social classes and social conflicts. When Europeans began to explore the Pacific, Social stratification had already been a distinct characteristic of some societies, particularly in Polynesia and Micronesia. 
The colonial intruders, with their superior wealth, knowledge, technology, and power, much admired and coveted by the people, fitted in quite comfortably to the upper social strata of the societies, thereby strengthening and perpetuating the hierarchical system. It was further reinforced by the decision in the colonial powers to administer their colonies through indirect rule, a system which they ruled the people through their traditional leaders. It was cheap and much more convenient. In most of Melanesia, however, where there was a virtual absence of any form of social stratification, Europeans automatically created one. By placing themselves at the top, the Asian immigrant, Im immigrant labor gradually maneuvered themselves through ambition, industry, thrift, and better understanding the modern economy and politics into the middle stratum leaving the indigenous people with their almost total ignorance and lack of appreciation of, mo of the modern world to form the bottom rung of this newly introduced class structure. Gradually, however, in response to the activities of Christian missions, the impact of World War II, pressure from the United Nations and other international organizations more enlightened colonial administrations after 1945 and com commercial development, Pacific Islanders managed to break down the formidable class barriers within their societies. Social mobility became possible so that in Polynesia and Micronesia, those commoners who were highly qualified academically could now join the top elegance of the societies by being appointed or elected to decision-making bodies, as well as through in the marriage with members of aristocracy, which had previously been impossible, as the Tongans to tell you all about these. In Melanesia, the islanders' experience during World War II changed the perceptions of Europeans dramatically when, for the first time, they witness the majority of their colonial masters fleeing for their lives in fear of the non-white Japanese and others recruited to the fighting forces doing dirty manual work before they never believed that white men was capable of dirtying their fingers. But they were forced during the war to do that, and that was quite a revelation. It was also an eye-opener for them to meet friendly and more generous white people in the military forces, some of whom were very anti-colonialism and to see black Americans in the forces on terms of equality with whites. It is not difficult to imagine how Melanesians reasoned that if black Americans and Japanese could do these things, why couldn't they? Race relations were never the same again. Since independence, well-qualified Melanesians have now taken over the top occupational stratum which had been exclusively held by Europeans and they form an educated elite which lives a lifestyle that is almost identical to that of their former colonial masters. These ex exciting changes, however, have brought with them not only blessings, but sadly, corresponding misery to individuals and to societies in Oceania. 
as some of the more privileged educated elite begin to treat their own people in much the same way the expatriates used to treat them. A powerful play, Which Way, Big Man, by a Papua New Guinean writer, Nora Vaki Brush, viciously attacks this kind of attitude. A growing gap between the privileged lifestyle of the world of educated elites, many of whom have become instantly millionaires, and the extreme poverty and lack of opportunities of the ordinary people has led to tensions in the growing and worrying problem of crime and delinquency among disaffected young people who were not fortunate enough to join the elite. The status of women. Another important social issue has been the status of women in the Pacific. As was true of most traditional societies, male domination in the Pacific was unquestioned. However, in Micronesia and Polynesia in particular, women, especially those of chiefly rank, were treated with honor and respect. In Tonga, for example, the sister was higher in rank than her brother, irrespective of age, and the most respected and influential member of an extended family was its paternal aunt. Some chiefly women became title holders and even outstanding political leaders while others joined the priestly class as priestesses. It was known in Tonga that even during a war, a chiefly woman would walk through the, the land of the enemy and she would never be touched. She used to uh, negotiate uh, reconciliation between her people and the enemy. Women were not excluded completely from sacred or religious ceremonies. Nevertheless, ordinary women were normally under male domination. In Melanesia, despite women's vital role in child care, production of food, gardening and pig husbandry, and other domestic duties, they were regarded by men with fear distrust, and quite often, outright contempt. Women were believed to be a source of ritual pollution in many societies, being highly dangerous to men, especially at the time of menstruation. A few years ago, a Highlander in Papua New Guinea axed his wife to death because he found out she had been cooking for him and his friends while she was menstruating. In court, he stated that he couldn't understand what the fuss was all about. After all, she was only his wife. Women were excluded from any sacred or religious ceremonies, never allowed to enter the prestigious and often spectacular men's houses and were deliberately and unashamedly exploited and frequently subject to physical violence by men. Wife, wife beating was regarded as normal. Unfortunately, in the villages, if a wife was not beaten up for a while, she started to suspect that the husband must, must, must be interested in some other woman. So, <clears throat> so it got to be regular. It must be noted, however, that the position of women in societies with a matrilineal system of, dis of descent 
was not as inferior as in those with a markedly patrilineal emphasis. The, the contact with Europeans helped to introduce positive changes to the position of women in the Pacific societies. Christian missions gave women a place in religion from which they had previously been excluded. Church membership was open to them and education, both spiritual and secular, became available to them, although training for the Christian ministry was normally reserved for men until quite recently. Able women with educational qualifications became increasingly eligible for important positions of leadership and employment in the church, government, business, and society in spite of strong resistance from the more conservative elements. This was further encouraged by colonial transformations prior to independence, and it became an important policy of various specific governments after independence. In Papua New Guinea, the promotion of women's equality became enshrined, enshrined in its constitution and the government's aid point plan. Economic dynamics. Land. Traditional economy in the Pacific was primarily subsistence and land was the people's most valuable possession. It belonged to descent groups such as tribes, clans or subclans and was portioned out by chiefs or elders responsible to individual households for cultivation and residential purposes. The rest remain common land for hunting, food gathering, and sacred grounds for burial purposes and religious ceremonies. There was a strong spiritual affinity with land. In certain areas of Polynesia, such as Tonga, land belonged to chiefly titles and the title holders were responsible for its distribution. They organized the cultivation, harvesting, and distribution of produce. The introduction of the plantation economy, mining industry by Europeans led to the land alienations throughout Oceania. In some areas, such as Fiji and American Samoa, colonial powers protected the land for the indigenous people by prohibiting its alienation. And in Tonga, which was never colonized, there was total prohibition of land alienation. But in other areas, such as New Caledonia and New Hebrides and New Guinea, people either sold off their uh, supposedly surplus land in order to gain much coveted European goods, or were forced off their rich and fertile land into less inviting reserves in favor of European settlers. I'm afraid we are running short of time. I have to cut uh, a few things out and uh, see that we can cover the lecture in time. Labor. Prior to World War II, commercial plantations, business and trade were monopolized by expatriates and Pacific Islanders mainly supplied unskilled labor for European enterprises, particularly on plantations and mines. World War II experience, however, uh, precipitated change to all this by exposing Pacific Islanders to new outsiders who didn't conform to the racial codes of conduct which governed pre-war relations. Many were employed by the American army during the war with comparatively high wages and much better working conditions than they had ever experienced before. They refused to return to pre-war conditions after the war and internal demands for improved working conditions and wages forced the colonial powers to change their policies in the matters including 
the establishment of labor unions. Ownership of productions. In addition to improving wages and working conditions, colonial administrations began to prepare peoples for self-government and eventually independence and to encourage indigenous people to participate in economic development. Massive amounts of aid were poured into promoting education and economic development of the native peoples from the early 1960s on. Secondary and tertiary institutions, including technical training centers, were established, overseas training schemes were set up. Today, Pacific Islanders are participating meaningfully in economic development, monopolizing labor with strong trade unions and sharing often with overseas investors in the ownership of production. A successful class of local businessmen and women has now emerged, though there are still significant hurdles uh, to overcome. important question that we should raise now is will the new class of local masters which has now taken over the economy be any different from their predecessors political dyna dynamics like other aspects of pacific cultures traditional political system were significantly affected by contact with Western civilization. Inspired by the wealth, knowledge, technology, and power they witnessed, outstanding and ambitious Polynesian chiefs that one writer referred to as little Napoleons of the Pacific, rose to political prominence towards the end of the 18th uh, and the beginning of the 19th century using firearms and friendly Europeans or captives as advisors, suppliers, and repairers of weapons, they and their supporters set out to defeat their political rivals and to unite the politically fragmented countries at the time into Polynesian kingdoms. And with the exception of Tonga, where there had been royal dynasties traditionally, established royal dynasties for the first time. Kamehameha I united Hawaii into a kingdom and established a Kamehameha dynasty there. Pomare I did the same in Tahiti and Thakumpao in Fiji. In Tonga, Thaufahau, better known as King George the I, united the separate groups into a single kingdom under the rulership of the Tuikanokubul dynasty. Their missionary backers helped these rulers to draw up codes of law and constitutions, as special schools were established for training of future political leaders, particularly the sons and daughters of the, of the chiefs. The pursuit of international rivalry by the main imperial powers in the Pacific caused the inevitable disappearance of three of the four Polynesian kingdoms, which not only had internal problems of their own, but also lacked any means of defense against the more powerful colonizing nations. Hawaii became a part of the United States of America, Tahiti a part of France overseas in Oceania, and Fiji a British colony, Tonga alone escaped and remains a kingdom to this day. New political boundaries were drawn up. Samoa was divided into German or Western Samoa and American uh, Eastern Samoa. Tahiti, Marquises, Tomoto, and Ostros became French uh, possessions, as did New Caledonia and Wallis and Futuna, and so on. I'm sorry, I have to skip this. Uh, you are familiar with uh, the reorganizations of the colonies uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of, uh, of the 19th century. 
post-independence threatening in the <clears throat> instability. During the first few years of social and political harmony, excitement and calmness, the idealism and political rhetoric of the immediate pre-independence period were maintained. But after having tasted power, prestige, and a life of luxury thrust upon them with unprecedented speed, many of the political and educated elite began to lose control of themselves. While the rhetoric continued unabated, the idealism and concern for welfare of their people were gradually replaced, sad to admit, by greed, self-interest, lust for power, immoral living, and corruption. Social unrest, <clears throat> all these things are well documented. Social unrest and political storms gather in the 1980s, threatening the stability of many Pacific countries. The determination to maintain their hold on power by those who, hold it, who held it, and the equally determined, determined attempt to gain it by those who had missed out is reflected in the political events which have been well covered by the media and are not, no doubt familiar to most of you, with constant changes in government leading to vilification of the, of the previous leaders, whether it be in the Cook Islands, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, or Fiji. Fortunately, there are a few prominent people in the public arena who have withstood the destructive forces of political life and been able to preserve their honesty and integrity. There has been a healthy continuation of democratic process which enables the, for, uh, the force of public disapproval of corruption and misbehavior to be felt in times of election when those with proven records of corruption are voted out. <clears throat> Spiritual dynamism and <clears throat> dynamics. Every country in the Pacific now regards itself and it's regarded by others as Christian country, at least officially. Christian monotheism uh, has replaced polytheism, Polynesia, and animistic beliefs in ma magic, sorcery, and ancestral spirit in Melanesia, and coexistence of all above in. Micronesia. Let's skip to the last part, which is the future. Any attempt to predict the future with exactitude is fraught with danger because of unforeseen phenomena, phenomena <coughs> that could arise at any time to influence the directions in which society changes. Who, for instance, could have predicted in 1939 that any Pacific colonies would have gained their independence before the end of the 20th century? However, one can tentatively make cautious predictions based on certain trends which are quite evident at present. Among the more pessimistic forecasts that warrant careful and tactful handling are the impending population explosion, class or racial conflicts, corruption in high places, problems of law and order, unemployment, poverty, secularism, racism, and moral decline, sectarian, <coughs> sectarianism, and religious intolerance. More problems are likely to occur in Melanesia than Polynesia and Micronesia because of firstly the lack of cultural coherence, national unity and increasing pressures of regionalism as it cases in Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu which has been mitigated in Micronesia by its being divided into smaller and more manageable states. 
Secondly, because of racial incompatibility, as it apparent in Fiji and New Caledonia. However, <clears throat> the increasing extent of corruption among the elite throughout the Pacific, bribery, misappropriation of public funds, nepotism, exploitation of the poor, unequal distribution of education, wealth, and opportunities for employment, and the misuse of power, if they continue to go unchecked, will become serious sources of social unrest and political instability in the Pacific. It will tear our small countries to pieces. Among the more positive trends which need warm support and positive encouragement and the breaking down of class barriers through education, the improvement in living standards of the poor through economic development, and the increasingly important role played by women who are now participating meaningfully in the development of their countries, the seeking of solution to the problems of law and order, unemployment, and closer economic, political, and religious cooperation among the Pacific countries and the larger metropolitan nations such as the USA, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, which border in the Pacific. Regional cooperation is improving a lot, being facilitated by organizations such as the Pacific Forum and SBC etc., etc. Being the conscience of the societies, religious organizations have an important contribution to make these future developments, particular in a determined and tireless effort to stand more closely together emphasizing the positive issues that we share in common rather than our differences to ensure maximum social, economic, political, and spiritual benefits, not just for a privileged few, but for all the inhabitants of Oceania. Thank you very much.